Good morning. Welcome to um, Nebraska Medicaid and Long-Term Care's Heritage Health Provider Webinar Agenda. Um, we have on our agenda today to provide an overview of our Heritage Health Managed Care program that is going live in January. We will then be having a presentation by each of our Heritage Health plans around provider credentialing and contracting. Um, and then we will have time for question and answers at the very end of our webinar. So welcome to our webinar and I will let Carmen begin our presentation. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us. My name is Carmen Bockel, and I'm the Communications Coordinator for the Division of Medicaid and Long-Term Care. We're going to be focusing today on the new Heritage Health Program, which is the state's new managed care integrated delivery system. So we have several presenters in our lineup this morning. Joining us from United Healthcare Community Plan of Nebraska, we have Kim Manning, Director of Marketing and Community Outreach, Barbara Palmer, Registered Nurse, Director of Health Services, Adam Proctor, Behavioral Health Clinical Manager, and Jeremy Sand, Director of Network Strategy. From WellCare of Nebraska, we'll be hearing from Laura Lee Rubel, the State President. And from Nebraska Total Care, we have Ryan Sadler, CEO and Plan President, Chris Stark, Vice President of Network and Development, Nancy Davis, Vice President of Network Strategy, Marsha Bach, Director of Medical Management Operations, Michelle Brochu, Senior Director of Behavioral Health Contracting, and Julie Rothacker, Senior Director of Clinical Behavioral Health. First, I'll begin this morning by going through a presentation to give everyone an overview of what Heritage Health is, the history of managed care in the state, and what it means for our recipients and providers going forward. After this brief overview, you'll be hearing from each of the health plans regarding their credentialing process. A snapshot of Medicaid in Nebraska today. We currently have approximately 230,000 enrollees at an annual cost of about $1.8 billion in actual health care expenditures that we're reimbursing or that we're paying our health plans for. Our total budget in the division is a little over $2 billion when you include the administrative costs. So the vast majority, as you can see, is financed for the actual health care services. At this time, about 12% of our state's population in Nebraska is eligible for Medicaid. Currently, we have a managed care program. We've had managed care in Nebraska since 1995, and what managed care is is a system of health care delivery, which the department contracts with the health plans to administer health care benefits and services for our enrollees. Managed care has evolved over a number of years across the country as the states have learned more about how to administer the programs, the types of contracts they could enter into, the different federal authorities, and the oversight that exists to help govern the programs. But in Nebraska today, we contract with three regional MCOs, which stands for Managed Care Organization. The MCOs are contracted for physical health services for our enrollees. Physical health services would include hospital visits, doctor's office visits, those routine medical care services. So depending upon what part of the state you live in, as a Medicaid recipient, you'll choose from one of two regional health plans for your physical health services. One plan operates statewide, while the two others each operate in their own region, so everyone has a choice of two currently. We also have a separate managed care entity for behavioral health services. That's operated statewide, and there's one contractor for managing those behavioral health services, and currently that's Magellan. So almost all recipients in Medicaid that receive behavioral health services have those services administered through Magellan. And then we also separately have a pharmacy benefits manager that we contract with to manage the pharmacy services for the entire program and all of the recipients. So depending on where you are in the program and what services you are receiving, as a Medicaid recipient in Nebraska today, you could potentially be having three different entities managing your health care services, which can actually increase to four when you include waiver services or in-home services that we provide. So there can be a lot of disconnect between those different systems. And one of our goals with Heritage Health that I'll talk about today is to help bring those together to create a more coordinated system. Today, about 82% of our Medicaid enrollees are enrolled in a physical health managed care plan. So that's nearly everyone. And with a few very small exceptions, more than 99% are enrolled in the behavioral health managed care plan. In a traditional fee-for-service state-administered program, the state is responsible for contracting with the healthcare providers that are delivering the services and receiving the claims from them. 
processing them and paying for them, but depending on the level of utilization, our level of cost can be somewhat unpredictable. With managed care, we use a capitated model in which we make a fixed monthly payment to the managed care organization, and they are then responsible for managing that provider network and paying those claims. The monthly payments are adjusted based on the level of care that an individual needs, where they live, the relative level of risk to their health, this approach creates more budget predictability for the state in that we can kind of forecast our needs based on our enrollment trends and then predict how much we're going to be paying each month to the health plans for those services. Those fixed rates are developed by our actuaries. They look at our trend of healthcare costs. They look nationally at what trends are coming in terms of healthcare expenditures, and they develop rates that are designed to be inclusive of the cost of healthcare services. The managed care program also improves efficiency over the fee-for-service system in that the health plans tend to be better equipped to manage the utilization. They can do care coordination and help lower overall costs by reducing some of the more costly care, like emergency room utilization and hospitalization. So to compare those two models, we have the at-risk model, which the payment, as I said, is made to the health plan before the services are delivered and the risk is assumed by the managed care organization. Whereas with fee-for-service, the state is paying for those services after the costs have already been incurred. What the fee-for-services system doesn't necessarily do is reward managing better health and having better health outcomes. Because oftentimes, the state of health is actually a lack of health care. Meaning you're well, you're getting preventative services, and you're not utilizing health care services. So we're trying to shift that model away from the pay for volume and go more toward a pay for value. The first steps towards this goal were made throughout the past 20 years of managed care. But you'll see that with Heritage Health, we're trying to go a step further by engaging our providers into that equation as well. So one of the key responsibilities of the plans that we've contracted with for Heritage Health is care management. Really putting an emphasis on primary care, preventative care, triage and referral out for services like behavioral health and disease management. So identifying through health risk assessments those individuals that have multiple or even a single chronic condition and stratifying them in terms of the level of risk and then plugging them into different care management programs that might have different levels of intervention from very basic telephone checks just to say, how are you doing? Do you need help scheduling an appointment? Do you need help with transportation services? To the more intensive care management where they have an assigned care manager in the community that may be going out to their home and visiting them and checking up with them at different levels. So we want to see different risk stratification, different levels of care management. Quality management is really having a more formal structure, a formal plan for what our goals are around quality, what are the metrics that we're prioritizing that we're measuring our performance by for the health outcomes. You'll see lots of national performance metrics included like, like the HEDIS measures, which are a national measure set around healthcare quality and outcomes member surveys and member experience surveys about their level of access to care, their level of satisfaction with their provider, their satisfaction with their health plan, and also more focus on engaging the health plans and helping us with performance improvement projects. So identifying priorities, areas of concern, areas where we see opportunities to improve, and focusing our efforts around them. Utilization management is another key responsibility. Looking prospectively at pre-certifying or pre-authorizing certain services before they can be administered to make sure that they fit within clinical guidelines, that they're at the right level of care, and that they meet our medical necessity criteria. Concurrent review, for example, working with the provider for discharge planning when an individual is ready to leave the hospital to help determine what, what the right timing is, what that next level of care looks like, and making sure that there's follow-up and continuity of services. Are they getting their prescriptions filled? Are they getting connected into in-home health as necessary? Then the retrospective review, looking at claims to give resources and insight about what those utilization patterns look like and maybe help lower that cost and improve their outcomes. Provider network management. One of the big reasons the states have moved towards managed care is that there are a lot of federal regulations that really limit the state's ability to truly manage the program. Health plans are better equipped and actually have better flexibility to do that. One of the ways is around managing the provider network, being able to have individualized agreements with different providers to build in certain outcome metrics or reimbursement priority criteria. Also making sure they have policies for continued access whenever providers change, with someone that's there to assist you in transitioning from one provider to the next. Potentially if they leave the network or stop providing Medicaid services. And then having provider education. People that can go out to be on the site with the provider, 
help the provider with billing issues, claim issues, or the latest medical guidelines that are available. So what's happening with Heritage Health? We've had managed care, as I said, for a number of years in Nebraska with physical health and then the separate behavioral health. Medicaid and long-term care has now entered into contracts with three health plans, Well Care of Nebraska, Nebraska Total Care, or Centene, and United Healthcare Community Plan of Nebraska. Each of these health plans will operate statewide and provide integrated healthcare services, which include physical health, behavioral health, and pharmacy services to enrollees beginning January 1st of 2017. We're working diligently to make this transition, including readiness, provider education, planning the enrollment period for members to select and enroll in their health plan, and making sure that the provider networks are prepared for the transition. While each of the managed care organizations maintain their own credentialing process, one universal feature is that each of the plans will accept provider credentialing information through the Council for Affordable Quality Healthcare. It is important to note that the providers enrolled with CAQH will need to ensure that their profile is up to date and has been attested to within the past six months. Additionally, each of the healthcare I'm sorry, the Heritage Health MCOs will need to be selected as an approved payer in order to access the CAQH profile. With all of the goals of the program that we've identified, improved health outcomes is the number one goal. We want to focus on seeing better quality and better outcomes for our recipients, better integration of services with better coordination across physical, behavioral, and pharmacy services having an emphasis on a person-centered approach toward identifying an individual's needs and wrapping services around them, care management, more preventative services, more recovery-oriented care, and reducing the rate of cost and avoidable care. So really trying to examine emergency room utilization for non-emergency needs, hospitalization, re-hospitalization that is unnecessary, having those metrics in place and engaging the plans and providers to help us address those. Then, of course, the improved financial sustainability of the system. As we bring more services, more populations into risk-based managed care, it creates better budget predictability for us and hopefully lowers the cost growth curve to a manageable level so that we can stay at an annual growth rate that allows us to be sustainable. One of the big changes, as I said, under Heritage Health is the integration of behavioral health services. This is really designed to help us better identify and manage individuals that have concurring behavioral health and physical health needs. In fact, there's a lot of data that suggests that individuals with behavioral health often have unmet physical health needs or chronic conditions, and the cost of treating those chronic conditions for an individual with serious mental illness can be many times higher. Their compliance rates are poor, they are in and out of the hospital more often, they are in and out of the emergency room more often, and individuals with serious mental illness live, on average, 25 years less. So we really want to put a lot of focus on making sure that we're identifying those individuals and wrapping the right services around them. And part of that is just by bringing them together under one contract. You have one entity that's now contractually and financially incentivized and obligated to look across that full spectrum. With the current system today, there's often confusion about who's paying for what. If an individual shows up at the emergency room, is the primary need physical or is it behavioral? Who is responsible for them? This split in coverage can limit the motivation to make investments in those preventative behavioral health and community-based services. So by bringing all of these services together, you create better incentives to make those investments on the front end. We also know this is a big change for our system, for our providers, for our staff, to go from having one behavioral health contractor that everyone deals with to having three. So one of the steps we've taken was the creation of the Behavioral Health Integration Advisory Committee, which includes Medicaid along with the Division of Behavioral Health, the plans, various providers and advocates, all at the table planning and making sure that we're thinking through the different things that we need to make this a smooth transition in 2017. We're also introducing some new populations into managed care through Heritage Health. Currently, some of the groups that are excluded from physical health managed care, meaning they're completely in the fee-for-services system, are individuals who participate in home and community-based waiver programs, like the Aged and Disabled Waiver, the Traumatic Brain Injury Waiver, and waivers for individuals with developmental disabilities. Those waivers provide in-home care services or other community services support services for individuals that have these long-term care needs. A lot of these enrollees also have significant physical health and behavioral health needs. So under Heritage Health, they will be able to benefit from the advantages of care coordination, 
and having a health plan for their physical health, pharmacy, and behavioral health services. In addition, individuals that live in institutional settings like nursing homes or intermediate care facilities for people with developmental disabilities, those institutional level of care clients will also be in Heritage Health. So while all of those individuals are new to managed care and they will have their benefits coordinated through their Heritage Health plan, their actual long-term support services, those actual in-home services or residential services, those will continue to be authorized and paid as they are today. So the Heritage Health plans initially are only taking over responsibility for their hospital, doctor's office, pharmacy, and community behavioral health services. Some of the key features that you'll see in the contracts is a greater focus on quality, care management, and introducing the concept of social determinants of health into the health plan's responsibility. We have formalized structures to have cross-divisional partnerships for managing the program and working with the health plans, performance metrics that are specific to our Medicaid members that are identified in the contract and can be updated with the impact of our quality committee, which met for the first time in June and will continue to meet quarterly, a bigger onus on the health plans to help identify those early needs for care management through those health risk assessments. And then making sure that they are not just looking at the health care needs or behavioral health needs of the individuals, rather they are utilizing that overall health risk assessment strategy and care management strategy and identifying individuals who have other social needs. So whether that's food security or housing needs, we can help connect those individuals into other community and state resources that are available to assist them. Common sense as well as strong data suggests that an individual who is chronically homeless and diabetic is going to have a harder time managing their diabetes and is going to spend more time in the emergency room than someone who's not. If you're worried about where you're going to sleep tonight, it's difficult to manage your blood sugar. So really trying to help identify what those needs are and address them so that the individual, their health plan, and their provider can focus on their specific health care needs. There are requirements in the contracts for developing and building provider networks that meet geographic time and distance standards based on where the member lives for all the different types of providers. Hospitals, specialists, primary care physicians, pharmacies, behavioral health providers, as well as substance abuse disorder and allied health providers. So lots of focus on primary and preventative care. Making sure everyone has an assigned primary care physician. One of the ways we want to begin to measure is can people actually connect with these providers? Are they accepting patients? Are they able to schedule an appointment? So those metrics are all included as well. And then continuing that focus on the health plans helping providers develop patient-centered medical homes and meeting those criteria. Accountability is a big theme throughout Heritage Health. We have strong contracts at the foundation that clearly set out what our expectations are and what our performance standards are. And then we want to make sure we have policies and procedures in place that really hold them accountable. So all of their policies and procedures have to be reviewed and approved by us. We have numerous reporting requirements on both operational and outcome performance metrics for everything from their call center performance time, their claim processing timeliness, to those actual outcomes and HEDIS metrics. Plans are required to give us full access to all of their systems and information. We will be conducting periodic operational and readiness reviews prior and after we go live. There are also financial incentives, sanctions, and penalties built into the contracts and tied to their performance. They have to deposit 1.5% of their total revenues into a reinvestment account that they have to earn by meeting certain quality metrics. There are financial sanctions and intermediate sanctions in place. If they don't meet certain contractual responsibilities, then those quality metrics that are tied to performance standards will be revisited annually with the input of our quality committee. We also want to make sure that we're supporting our providers. Managed care is not always fun for healthcare providers, and admittedly, we're adding additional layers of administrative complexity to the system. Under the traditional fee-for-service model, there's only one entity to bill, which is the state. So health plans do add that additional layer, but those plans are making sure that there's proper concurrent review, utilization management, accurate billing, and ensuring providers are credentialed properly. So while we recognize those challenges, we do think there's value in creating those layers but we also want to make sure that there aren't layers of administrative complexity that don't add value to the system. So we have contractual requirements making sure that they have timely processing, timely payments, timely credentialing, application processing, so those standards are all set there. 
We're also going to require that they continue to follow our state preferred drug list. Even though they're managing the pharmacy benefit, they will have to follow our PDL. So prescribers won't have to navigate multiple different preferred drug lists to figure out which specific drug they should prescribe for a member, depending on which health plan they are enrolled in. There are a lot of requirements for the plans to engage in provider training and making sure providers are ready to bill in their systems and that they understand their policies and procedures. Having dedicated provider support staff available in our state on the ground ready to assist providers and that they also individually have provider advisory committees with Nebraska providers to meet regularly and provide input about operational issues and a provider complaint system. We also have an administrative simplification committee that meets regularly with state staff, health plans, and providers to focus specifically on these issues and continuously identify opportunities where maybe we can create some consistent policies across the health plans, consistent health forms, or other areas where we can knock out any administrative complexity that's not adding any value. So speaking of value, we really wanted to focus on value within these contracts. One of the ways that we're trying to tackle that is that the health plans are required at certain points in their contract to have certain percentages of their provider network in value-based contracts. And what that means is in their contracts with the provider to provide services for the members, they have to have some element of quality outcome or cost metrics that they are then engaged with the health plan in meeting. And then there are also financial incentives to meet those, whether that's performance payment, shared savings methodology, or subcapitation, which is when they actually pay the providers a fixed monthly rate, managing their patient populations while taking on some of the risk as well. There's multiple different ways that plans and providers can enter into these types of arrangements, but we didn't want to be terribly prescriptive because we want plans and providers to determine what works best for them and what works for their type of practice. So for example, you may begin with an upside only shared savings where the provider only gains if they save money but doesn't necessarily lose if they don't, and then evolve over time to a true shared savings and loss where they take on some risk. There are several ways they can tackle that, but we want the providers to be engaged and have the same incentives as the health plans to manage care, create better outcomes, and to lower the cost. Under the current system, you've got this constant tension between the payer and the provider where one makes money while the other loses money. So we want to try and ease and reduce some of that tension that exists. A big focus, obviously, for us is on our members. They are at the heart of what the program is all about, and it wouldn't exist without them. So we've got to make sure that there are strong protections in place for actually engaging them in the program, making sure the health plans are providing them with timely and accurate information, that it's accessible, it's at the right level with the correct information in it, that they have toll-free call centers, that they're meeting those performance standards, that their grievance process is extensive, it's approved by us, ensuring they will always have access to the fair, state fair hearing process as a step beyond those initial MCO appeals, and that they do member surveys using, using national standards. The CAP survey, which is a national health plan recognized survey process, which we can measure objectively kind of what the member experience looks like by health plan. And then member choice. We want to make sure the members are engaged in choosing their health plans now and that during the open enrollment period, if they're not satisfied, they can choose a different health plan. One of the ways we're doing that is by expanding our enrollment broker capabilities. Our enrollment broker will be assisting the members with their choice to find the plan that best fits their needs. We want the members to select their plan to have that voice in their care. When absolutely necessary, if the member is unable to choose their plan, then the enrollment broker will have the responsibility of auto-assigning members to the plan that best meets their individual needs. We want to support our partners across the division and other state programs as well. There are clear requirements that the Heritage Health Plans have liaisons and coordinate with sister DHHS divisions to have them participate in our committees, behavioral health and developmental disabilities, Children and Family Services will be involved for the youth that are in foster care, as those youth that are in the, that system will be receiving services through Heritage Health. Bringing various representatives together will give us a better alignment and coordination. This expands beyond DHHS as well. There's the Department of Education, Office of Probation, other community and local agencies. We want to bring everyone to the table and have expectations that the health plans are communicating and coordinating with. And then, like I said, we want to make sure we have a smooth, smooth transition. The plans will have to submit to us for approval their transition and implementation plans. 
We're currently immersed in our collaborative implementation period. There are key staffing requirements that are in place throughout this time period, specifying which roles need to be filled to ensure a presence throughout the time frame leading up to 2017. Additionally, they have to have their network in place three months before we go live to make sure that we will be able to assess if they are meeting our network requirements and that their members are prepared to transition to those providers by January 1st of 2017. There are also continuity, continuity of care provisions that require that any services that have been pre-authorized for a certain period of time after the contract starts will have to be authorized even if it's out of network for a certain period after we go live. I briefly mentioned our enrollment broker. We've contracted with automated health systems to provide this service. A key principle for Heritage Health is member choice. So AHS will provide member outreach and support during the open enrollment period to help individuals determine which health plan will best meet their needs. Their contact includes letters alerting the members of the open enrollment period, phone calls to provide any necessary counseling as they review their options, and searchable databases for primary care providers. We want to make sure that we have regular communication about what's happening and what's going on. We've created the Heritage Health branding to help create a unified picture of what the program looks like. We've launched web pages where you can go and learn more about Heritage Health. There are links to the procurement materials, the RFP, and the contracts. Our presentation materials and handouts will all be posted there, including this PowerPoint. We've also posted an FAQ that's being continually updated throughout this process. And we have a link where additional questions can be submitted to our subject matter experts. The clock is ticking down to 2017, and we have a lot of information to broadcast about Heritage Health. So we're taking proactive steps in communications to ensure that we have significant stakeholder involvement as we move forward. So where are we today? This is a broad overview of what the timeline looks like. As I mentioned before, we're in the midst of the implementation process. Our committees for quality management, behavioral health integration, and administrative simplification are all now in full swing. Those committee meetings are part of the Nebraska Public Meetings calendar with agendas and meeting materials provided on our website. We're looking ahead to our readiness reviews, actively planning the open enrollment approach with AHS, and keeping our site set on that go-live date of January 1, 2017. Again, I just want to emphasize that our focus is on unity. We know that we're better together, so each of the divisions within the department are present at the table. We're all collaborating to work together on this. Even though it's a Medicaid program and Medicaid contracts, the entire agency touches base with these same clients across different programs. At the heart of it, we're all trying to work together to deliver better services for people and deliver better value for the taxpayers. So we want to make sure that we have good communication as we move forward with Heritage Health. The web page for Heritage Health is being updated regularly, and any questions about Heritage Health can be submitted through the questions link on that web page or by email to dhhs.heritagehealth at nebraska.gov. I'd like to thank you for your time today, and I encourage you to subscribe to that web page for updates and to email our office directly with any questions. So at this time, we will welcome United Healthcare Community Plan of Nebraska to share information with you as it relates to their plan. Thank you, Carmen. This is Kim Manning. I'm the Director of Marketing and Community Outreach at United Healthcare. A quick update to our presenters for today. Bob Palmer and Adam Proctor are not with us. They are um, out of state for a health plan meeting. So Dr. Michael Horn is available for us and he is our Chief Medical Officer. Next. Next. Just want to highlight for everyone who has joined today for the webinar, um, United Healthcare is very focused on its mission, um, helping people live healthier lives every day. And in terms of our mission, we try to be the best health plan for our state partner in ensuring that we provide the benefits and services for all of our members and then also to be a good partner with the health systems, physicians, and other healthcare professionals um, within the state of Nebraska. Next. We'd like to highlight for you the United culture and the key values that we follow for our members and the providers who are our partners. 
and those are integrity, and that um, integrity really commits to our members and to work consistently to honor those commitments to our members and our providers. Compassion, we truly do walk in the shoes of the people we serve, and we demonstrate appreciation for the work of our providers um, within the communities that they serve. We feel like we need to earn as well as build trust through collaboration with our members and the state partner and our providers. United Healthcare is very focused on innovations, pursuing new innovations, and then seeking continuous improvement for the services that we provide for the members um, within the state of Nebraska. And then also for performance, demonstrating our excellence. We want to be accountable for the services and benefits that we provide and be responsible for quality results. Next. A couple um, things to highlight for the Nebraska Health Plan. We have been with Nebraska since 1984. Uh, we cover through many of our products um, over 428,000 individuals within the state. We have approximately um, 328 employees. In terms of our um, Medicaid Health Plan, we've been serving um, the Medicaid members for over 20 years and we are currently accredited by the National Committee of Quality Assurance since 2005. You will also note in terms of our network build-out um, contracts that we currently have and um, finalizing those within the state of Nebraska. I would like to now turn it over to my colleague, Jeremy Sand, who will be covering the remaining components of this pre presentation. Great, thank you, Kim. I'd like to talk about credentialing um, and what is a credentialing process. Um, United Healthcare credentialing and credentialing process is an industry standard systematic approach uh, that we use for the collection and the verification of a practitioner's um, professional qualifications. The credentialing process is based on NCQA standards, United Healthcare's credentialing and recredentialing plan, as well as the, the division of Medicaid and long-term care baseline criteria of the practicing specialty. We have provided our credentialing and recredentialing plan available on the website, unitedhealthcareonline.com, um, if you would like further information. Next slide. To initiate credentialing for United Healthcare Community Plan uh, Provider Network, you can call our automated service line, which we've listed there, and be prepared to provide your tax identification number and your social security number, and then follow the prompts. United Healthcare utilizes CAQH for gathering credentialing data for physicians and other healthcare professionals. Carmen has already provided an overview of CAQH, uh, so I will uh, continue on. Um, if you have specific questions um, around CAQH, we have provided uh, their contact information for you be, to um, be able to access them. Um, and then to avoid delays in the process, please make sure that you allow United Healthcare to have access to your CAQH profile. If you need assistance um, with any of uh, credentialing with United Healthcare around medical, uh, behavioral, or pharmacy, we have listed um, each of the contact information uh, for you to be able to direct questions to. Next slide. Next slide. So steps in our credentialing um, process. After receiving a completed application, United Healthcare will, will perform primary source verification to determine the accuracy of the individual healthcare practitioner's qualifications. The provider's request is presented to our credentialing committee to review and approve the application. Once approved, the provider is notified in writing of the credentialing committee's determination and the effective date of that, um, of that credentialing committee's um, determination. Our network team works with the provider to obtain a contract signature and then submit the provider ownership disclosure form for approval. The contract is then loaded for claims and then loaded for provider directory. Next slide. For contracting, United Healthcare is in a different position uh, than the new MCOs as it relates to contracting. Um, as Kim has mentioned, we've been in the market for over 20 years and already have Medicaid contracts in place with many of the providers statewide. 
as Heritage Health is integrating behavioral health and pharmacy into managed care, we are integrated with Optum uh, Behavioral Health and Optum Rx that are part of our United Health Group company. Contracting packets for behavioral health and pharmacy providers have been sent out, and the majority of the Medicaid providers are already um, contracted, and so we have not sent out um, those contracting packets. If you have not received the packet or you have further um, questions around the contracting process, we have listed out contacts uh, for medical providers. We've listed out contacts for the behavioral health providers and also for pharmacy. Next slide. In addition to uh, doing individual uh, credentialing, we also do delegated credentialing. United Healthcare may delegate responsibility for specific credentialing and recredentialing functions to another entity, uh, which is the delegated entity. And then we also retain the, the ultimate right to sign a participation agreement and manage the participation in the United Health Network. The important steps um, to the uh, delegated credentialing process or pre assessment of that delegated entity where we verify um, the entity's certifications as applicable. Um, and we assess the delegated entity's ability to meet our credentialing standards. In addition to the pre-assessment, we will also do an annual evaluation of the delegated entity. We will do ongoing oversight um, and review of the credentialing report submitted to United Healthcare, And then we will follow up to improve um, compliance. Next slide. Pharmacy credentialing um, is a little bit different. Independent pharmacies begin the process with submitting a credentialing application. It includes the complete disclosure of ownership, um, and interest statement forms, credentials, and applicable information. The credentialing application and contract packet are sent out together, and in that application it provides directions upon what you need to do um, to submit your credentialing application. The pharmacy contract is finalized after the application is reviewed. Uh, to verify uh, proof of credentials, which may include many of the items that we have listed below. Next slide. Pharmacies are also credentialed to ensure compliance with professional standards. We have listed some of those professional standards uh, below. The standard turnaround time for um, completion of a pharmacy uh, credentialing application is seven business days or less and we do do recredentialing for pharmacies at least uh, once every three years. In addition to independent uh, pharmacy credentialing, uh, we contract with chain pharmacies and pharmacy service administrative organizations uh, to delegate credentialing um, for all the pharmacies within their organization. We contractually require the organization to maintain a credentialing program for itself and member pharmacies. For pharmacy questions, we have listed the contact information uh, for you to call directly um, to either follow up or um, uh, to ask uh, further questions. Next slide. So lastly, for the credentialing process, we have provided a slide that gives helpful hints for completing um, a complete and clean application. You want to make sure that um, when you submit the application or upload it to CAQH, that you include the professional liability insurance fact sheet. Fact sheet. You want to include the name, NPI, and hospital privileges of the practitioner. And then you want to include the copy of the current DEA certificate or the name and the NPI of the practitioner who will write prescriptions. And as I said before, you want to make sure that you grant United Healthcare access to the CAQH application online. The credentialing timeframes takes approximately 30 days from receipt of a complete application. And then lastly, with the disclosure of ownership forms, um, you want to make sure that you provide your social security number and date of birth. And forms must be completed for each of the following. It's for the practice, for the practitioner, and any managing employees. Next slide. So for prior authorization, uh, notification of a request for service does not, is not a guarantee of payment. The care provider requesting prior authorization will receive a written decision of clinical coverage determination based on medical necessity. Clinical coverage re review will be conducted to determine if the service is medically necessary 
based on evidence-based clinical guidelines. It's important to make sure that when you submit, that you submit all the supporting clinical documentation to avoid uh, delays in receiving a decision of clinical coverage. If the clinical information submitted does not meet medical necessary guidelines, the care provider will be offered a peer-to-peer -peer review with the reviewing United Healthcare physician. Next slide. As we are integrating medical behavior and pharmacy, we've provided a sample list of service authorizations needing clinical coverage review. Um, a more comprehensive list will be available uh, online at unitedhealthcarecommunityplan.com. We've also listed a 1-800 number for you to be able to call. Uh, but we've listed out several that would include inpatient hospitalization service, um, durable medical equipment, diagnostic testing, psychological testing, um, transplant services, um, and certain uh, in instances, some prescriptions. Next slide. So for further information on prescribing information, as Carmen has said that we will have um, a preferred drug list, um, and that will be available on unitedhealthcarecommunityplan.com and following uh, the prompts. We will also have a prior authorization information line um, that you'll be able to uh, speak to a prescriber um, help desk. And then additionally, we will be um, providing formularies, uh, prior authorization lists, and this pre uh, prescriber reference guide available online. Next slide. So for claim submission process, there are several ways that um, providers are able to submit claims. Um, we can do that electronically through several clearinghouses. Um, and if you've got inquiries, uh, we've provided contact information that you can be able to go online uh, to uh, verify if your uh, clearinghouse is received by United. In addition to uh, clearinghouses, you could go to unitedhealthcareonline.com, which is a secure portal. Uh, that you'll be able to submit uh, claims as well as other functions such as viewing eligibility um, and submitting prior authorizations. And then lastly, you'll be able to uh, submit paper claims at the available um, mail address. Make sure that when you submit claims that you include the member subscriber ID number as well as the um, United Healthcare Payer ID number which we've provided. Next slide. So if you would like to um, be set up with electronic payments and statements. Um, there are several advantages uh, to being able to do that. It lessens the administrative costs and simplifies bookkeeping. It reduces reimbursement, reimbursement turnaround time, and then funds are, funds are delivered uh, directly into your bank account. Uh, for further information, you can go to unitedhealthcareonline.com and follow the prompts, or you can call the 1-800 number that we've listed there. Next slide. So providers may appeal any decision regarding authorization or provision of services that may include an adverse determination on the type or the level of service um, or anything around timely responses. Appeals can be made uh, by calling uh, the 1-800 number that we listed there or by sending in the appeal within 90 days uh, to the National uh, Appeals and Grievance Service Center with the address we listed there. Um, expedited appeal decisions can be requested. Um, that results in a 72-hour turnaround time, and the provider has a right to receive a copy of the rule used to make the decision. Next slide. So we've listed out several online provider resources for you. Link is our um, gateway to all of the United Healthcare Online tools and resources. Uh, Link is a, a visual um, online, uh, like your tablet or your iP iPad, it has several um, different applications for you to be able to, to access. Um, the neat thing about this is it allows you to be able to access many of our online tools without having to pull up several websites and use several login IDs. You have access to the United Healthcare Community Plan website. Um, in addition, you have access to um, the United Healthcare Online, which I've already talked about. Next slide. So in addition to several online um, resources that we've provided, we also have a provider relations service model. 
Um, we have provider advocates where we're um, specific to medical as well as behavioral. Um, they are United Healthcare Navigational Specialists. They're product experts. Uh, and they're externally focused to be able to be the relationship manager, uh, to, build, to build a collaborative working relationship, um, and being able to communicate um, externally to providers of upcoming changes, and being able to um, work with you to resolve any concerns. Next slide. And then we also have a provider relations service model um, where we have access to a self-service uh, online, 24 hours through link um, that can be accessed through unitedhealthcareonline.com. Uh, you can call our voice portal for self-service information at the 1-800 number that we've listed. And then you can also talk to a customer care representative to speak to. Um, they can also follow up with any of your questions. Next slide. And lastly, we've provided you a contact list of health plan representatives uh, that you can follow up with any questions directly. I'd like to thank you for uh, the opportunity to um, share with you uh, working with United Healthcare, and I'll turn it back over to Carmen. Thank you, Kim and Jeremy. Ne up next, we have Well Care of Nebraska. Hi, everyone. This is Laura Lee Rubel. I'm the plan president for Well Care of Nebraska. Um, I'm grateful for your time today. Thank you for being here. Um, <clears throat> since WellCare may be new to some of you, I'd like to take just a few minutes to introduce you to WellCare, uh, and then we're going to cover uh, some of the contracting and credentialing requirements and give you a preview of some of the tools and resources that you'll have available to you uh, while, as we move into our implementation in January. WellCare Health Plans, um, Similar to my colleagues, we all share a vision in um, supporting the members that we serve. The well care our members are our reason for being. We focus on those populations because we want to help them live better and healthier lives. Re relationships are everything, relationships with our members, providers, and our government partners. Uh, and our core values are partnership, integrity, accountability, and we operate as one team. We try to ensure that our customer service representatives, our provider relations representatives, our care coordinators, every single person understands that they are part of one team focused on that member to provide the best care and service. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Here's a graphic that shows what WellCare does and the, the areas in which we operate. We are uh, targeted to government-sponsored healthcare programs focusing on Medicaid, Medicare, and prescription drug plans. We serve a variety of people, and we include a focus on low-income, dual-eligible populations. As, as we all know, those groups have some unique needs and challenges uh, and often barriers to receiving healthcare or quality coordinated care. Um, we're also very focused on relieving the providers of some of the administrative burden and, and hassles that come through dealing with managed care. I know Carmen made reference earlier to our Administrative Simplification Committee here in Nebraska, and WellCare is excited to be part of any opportunity to make things simpler uh, to implement this program. Um, next slide, please. Again, just in the interest of introducing you to who WellCare is, while we are new to Nebraska, we are certainly not new to Medicaid uh, managed care. Currently, we serve a total of 3.7 million members across the country. Of that, 2.4 million are in Medicaid programs, and we serve a wide range of eligibility categories within Medicaid. Um, one of the things that we're particularly excited and um, innovative around is our established our ability and engagement in sustaining the social safety net. For those things that are not traditional Medicaid benefits, as, as Carmen mentioned, perhaps it's uh, you know whether it's homelessness or someone has transportation challenges or they need connection with a food bank. We've established um, an integrated model that we can help providers and community entities identify needs and meet them. Um, and now I'd like to shift gears a little bit and talk specifically about contracting with WellCare. Next slide, please. 
all of our provider packets have been mailed out, and we used um, we we were fortunate the state shared with all three plans a current roster of all Medicaid providers, and we use that for our mailing list. If you have not gotten a contract packet and you'd like one, I'll provide information at the end of my presentation about how to request one. Uh, these packets include some more information about WellCare, the actual contract, some more uh, a WellCare fact sheet, and then a provider profile sheet where you would complete and give us uh, some specifics about the providers that will be part of the contract, an IRS Form W-9, and the Nebraska Ownership and Controlling Interest and Conviction Disclosure Form. There are also instructions for help included in the packet if you need to contact someone at WellCare for help with completing any of the requested information. Let's talk a little bit about credentialing. I know um, the, uh, my colleague at United shared a lot of information and also um, Carmen did at the outset. So I won't, <clears throat> in the interest of moving us forward, I won't cover everything related to CAQH, but WellCare also accepts CAQH and you've become familiar now with some of the things you can do to make that go more smoothly uh, if you elect to go that route for your credentialing. Um, we do review uh, clean credentialing files every week by our medical director and they are approved accordingly. The credentials committee then meets monthly if there were any credentialing files that perhaps weren't deemed as clean um, and clean can mean a lot of different things. Perhaps it's um, not enough liability insurance or something came up during the primary source verification. Those are still reviewed um, at the credentials committee, which currently meets monthly, but as we move closer to January 1st, that will obviously meet weekly. Um, providers often want to know, well, what's my effective date going to be? If you go to the next slide, all contract effective dates for Heritage Health, for those providers who are properly credentialed in 2016, their contract effective date will be January 1st of 2017 to coincide with the launch of Heritage Health. Now that's important because, um, you know, we do have to have enough time to get you credentialed. And so the sooner that we can get your contract and credentialing process underway, the sooner we can make sure you're in place for January 1st. Um, for providers who wait and submit their contracts and are credentialed after January 1st, those contracts will not be effective until the first day of the following month. The provider will receive a letter which advises them of their effective date, along with their new well care provider identification number and instructions on how to register as a participating provider on our website. Again, I know we're all very focused on avoiding any delays in this process, so what can you do to help make sure it goes as quickly as possible. If we go to the next slide, one of the things that we see come up from time to time is that um, IRS Form W-9, that is the information that we are required to report um, our, our claims payment information about who the provider was that we paid. If that form doesn't match what's on the contract or the credentialing information, that can slow things down really unnecessarily. So I encourage you to make sure that as you're preparing your packet, the W-9 matches what's on the rest of the information. Um, if, <clears throat> if you're submitting a CAQH number in lieu of a credentialing application, make sure that that profile's been attested to in the last six months. Um, if the CAQH profile, or if you're not using CAQH, then the CV, the curriculum vitae, has a gap of more than five years, please provide an explanation. And then lastly, if the answer is yes to any of the disclosure questions on the Nebraska Ownership, Controlling Interest, and Conviction Disclosure Form, just please include an explanation. Let's shift gears now and talk just a little bit about claims and claim submission. Next slide, please. <clears throat> claims must be submitted within 180 days of the date of service. Claims will be processed and either paid or denied within 15 business days of the receipt of the claim. WellCare has daily check runs for both paper checks and our electronic funds transfer, BSC payments, except for Sundays and the very last day of the month. We will provide you much more information about how to register for EFP in some upcoming provider training sessions. Next slide. 
You can submit claims to WellCare three ways. Uh, you can either go through uh, EDI or electronic data interchange. WellCare's preferred clearinghouse is Relay Health. Relay Health has um, reciprocal agreements with many other clearinghouses. So if you don't work directly with Relay, um, it's, it's very likely that the clearinghouse you use does have a reciprocal the reciprocal arrangement with Relay. Another way to submit claims is through direct data entry on our secure web portal, and then there you have the um, mailing address for paper claims. We'll touch briefly on appeals. Next slide, please. <clears throat> A provider may request an appeal regarding provider payment or contractual issues on his or her own behalf within 90 days from the original UM decision or the date of the claim denial. Cases filed after 90 days will be denied for untimely filing. But if the provider feels like they did submit their case within the appropriate time frame, the provider may submit second, uh, another appeal with documentation showing proof of timely filing. The plan will respond to the authorization denial claim or claim-related issues within 60 calendar days of the day after the date of submission to the plan. And there's some information about when you're submitting an appeal, what, what will we be looking for from you? And there's the uh, address in front of you for submitting well care appeals. And again, just to, just to make sure, um, I know this was mentioned previously, this slide presentation and, and those of my colleagues will be posted on the Heritage Health website. So all this information will be available to you at the end of this presentation. Next slide. I'm going to touch briefly on utilization management. I know you've heard quite a bit about this already, and those of you working with managed care today are familiar with UM at, you know, at a, at a, at a global level. I want to talk to you a little bit about the way WellCare approaches UM. Um, the, the reasons why we require authorization can include a review for medical necessity, um, the appropriateness of the provider and or place of service, um, the appropriateness of the setting in which the service is being rendered. And then we also look for opportunities to support case management, disease management, or, or chronic care education opportunities. Decision time frames will be given, uh, notice will be given as expeditiously as the member's condition requires, but will never exceed 14 calendar days from the receipt of the request. Certain types of requests have specific contractual time frames, such as pharmacy, which we have to turn around within 24 hours. Then expedited requests will not exceed 72 hours from the receipt of the request. Prior authorizations may be requested three ways, online via the secure provider portal, by fax, or by telephone for urgent requests. Utilization management also includes, next slide please, um, retrospective review as an option. We review post-service requests for authorizations in instances of retro eligibility, retro eligibility, and the provider just needs to submit proof of retro eligibility when the retro review is requested. Retro eligibility occurs when a member has been deemed eligible for Medicaid for an effective date which predates the service being rendered. Um, a retrospective review can be initiated by well care or the provider and they may take up to 30 days to um, render a determination. We realize that utilization management can sometimes create administrative complexity, and we've created some tools that may help uh, streamline your um, partnership with WellCare in UM. Next slide, please. We've provided some resources on our web portal that we believe will help uh, providers navigate the UM process more smoothly. We have our clinical coverage guidelines that's a helpful search tool which allows providers to search evidence-based guidelines which detail the medical necessity of procedures or technology. We also offer clinical practice guidelines, the CPGs. These are best practice recommendations based on available clinical outcome trend and scientific evidence, and these are often what we rely on in making prior authorization decisions. Lastly, we have an authorization lookup tool, which is an easy way to verify authorization requirements by CPT code and by place of service. Next slide. This is a screenshot of our authorization lookup tool. 
as you can see, it's fairly self-explanatory. You would just um, enter the CPT code that you're looking for the authorization requirement on. And then uh, if you go to the next slide, it shows you in this instance we entered 99363, and depending on the place of service, well, in this instance, that CPT code does not require authorization in any of those settings. Um, I'll, I'll point you to the very bottom of that screenshot. I know it's a little bit hard to see, but we also create what we call our quick reference guide. This is a document that in a very abbreviated format gives you all of our authorization requirements, mailing addresses, um, appeals guidelines. It's a really great tool for your billing staff um, and prior authorization nurses. The team that's supporting managed care relationships will have and this quick reference got at their fingertips. Next slide, please. So again, as I mentioned at the outset, if you have not gotten your contract packet, please send us an email at networkexpansion at wellcare.com or give us a call at that toll-free number. Um, I'm very pleased to introduce you virtually to our Senior Director of Network Management, Tracy Smith. Tracy oversees both network development and the provider relations. We follow a similar provider service model where we have local provider relations staff available to support you, um, provide you with information and, and help resolve any claims issues or challenges that you're having in transacting business well care. So that's Tracy's email and direct line if you need to reach her. And at this time, I will conclude for WellCare, we'll stick around for questions, and I'll turn it over to Carmen. Thank you, Carmen. Thank you, Laura Lee. Our final presenter for this morning is Nebraska Total Care. Thank you, Carmen. Um, welcome, everyone. This is Nancy Davis with Nebraska Total Care. I appreciate the opportunity to present once again, um, and appreciate everyone who's joining. Um, next slide, please. For the presentation this morning, I'll be giving a brief uh, company overview of who Nebraska Total Care is, uh, discuss the contracting and credentialing um, requirements, touch on provider relations and our website and secure portal tools available. We'll talk a little bit about medical and UM, and then I believe at the end they're opening up for questions for all on the call. Next slide. Nebraska Total Care, uh, while we may be new to Nebraska, um, we are not new to managed care Medicaid. Our parent company is Centene Corporation based in St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, we've been around for about 32 years. We started as a community health center in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and have grown into um, Centene as it is today. We are in 28 states total, and 24 of those 28 is basically a contract directly with the state to manage Medicaid care for the, those members within that state. Um, so this slide is really just to kind of let you know um, we're not new to the game. Uh, we do have um, experience, you know, across the country. And also to let you know that um, because of our size, um, this is not, you know, new for us. And as far as claims processing is concerned, this is not our first market. Um, but we're welcome um, and very happy to be part of Nebraska. Next slide. Thank you. Um, on this slide, I just want to touch a little bit on our approach and how we come into a new market, a little bit about our care coordination efforts, and a little bit around culture sensitivity. Our local approach is really something that I think um, separates us from uh, some of the other managed care companies. In Nebraska, uh, we will have a local office in Omaha, um, also a satellite office in Lincoln, and in the very near future, one in western Nebraska as well, probably in the Scottsbluff area. Our local approach is really designed to uh, get to know the market, what are the resources available, uh, what is working in the market now in, within the community, um, and how can we expand on that and support what is already working for those members that we will be serving. As far as care coordination is concerned, our goal is to promote a medical home for each of our members and enable them to um, partner with, uh, with us. So that takes coordination among the provider community, um, associations that are already in existence, and as I mentioned before, other resources 
that are available to our members. As far as uh, compliance is concerned, our clinical quality performance efforts um, are set using HEDIS reporting. And also, uh, just lastly, just to touch on cultural sensitivity, we realize that, you know, even in Nebraska, there's a diverse membership uh, among the Medicaid membership. And uh, we work with the communities at a local level to form a partnership um, to bridge, you know, any social, ethnic, or economic gaps that might um, be present. Next slide. Thank you. This next slide, again, just kind of to explain, because when we come into a new market, um, you know, and we brand ourselves locally, so locally as Nebraska Total Care, uh, that's to just, again, uh, reiterate the fact that we are uh, local and we put our roots local as well. So um, whenever you call our member provider services line, you can be assured that you're speaking to someone who is in Nebraska. Um, and based here. So they're going to be familiar with the surroundings and when you mention, you know, a certain area or some, a certain resource, they should be familiar with that because they are, you know, from Nebraska. So this slide just kind of gives you an idea of the markets that we were we are in, again, spanning over the, um, the last 32 years. So you'll see that Nebraska is uh, one of our latest ones with the Heritage Health Program beginning on January 1st. Next slide, please. When we talk about integrated care, so of course with the Heritage Health Program, it's an integrated program with physical health, behavioral health, and pharmacy included. So just want to talk a little bit about our uh, specialty health solution. So Involve, when you think of that, that is basically um, the, the parent company that holds all of our specialty companies. So we have Involve Pharmacy, Involve People Care, which includes behavioral health, and then also involve benefit options, which is our vision and dental. While dental is carved out, um, just to let you know that on the vision side, um, that is part of our specialty companies. So um, while I'm on this slide, I will just let you know that for ophthalmology, so any uh, vision provider that is an MD would be contracted under a Nebraska Total Care. Um, if there are optometrists, so for routine eye care, uh, they would be contracted through Involve Our Vision Benefit Manager. Next slide. Okay. Um, and this slide is just to kind of touch base on something that seems very uh, local and um, present um, and an issue in Nebraska around interpretive services. Because you have a diverse population here, um, this is something that we offer, and I, I thought it would be good to touch base on this. We have national contracts with two companies. One is Boyens, the other is LSA, Language Service Associates. Boyens is our main vendor for um, telephonic interpretation, and LSA is our main vendor for face-to-face -face interpretation. But just to let you know, both of those um, vendors do offer um, both telephonic and face-to-face. -face. It's just that Boyens is our main vendor for the telephone interpretation. And you'll see the note below that either a member or a provider can call our um, provider call center and set up face-to-face -face interpretation services. Typically, we ask for a five-day notification, but we also understand that sometimes that's not possible, but we will make every attempt to accommodate all those requests for a face-to-face -face interpretation. And this is at no cost to the provider or the member. Next slide, please. Just to touch a little bit on our goals as a whole at Nebraska Total Care. Um, linking members, again, to the best medical home that's available to serve them. And the things that we take into consideration are, you know, their case management, uh, disease management, uh, member services, provider relations, and provider services. Uh, one of the bullets here talks about connection representatives. These are people that actually live within the community uh, with our members, so they're very familiar with the resources available in that community, um, and it many times could have been a Medicaid recipient um, themselves, so they would be very understanding of uh, the resources available. And of course, the, the main goal is to make sure that the care is provided in the most appropriate setting. Um, and then the last, slide, the last portion of the slide talks about coordinating care by reducing um, duplication or waste 
um, minimizing visits to the emergency room when possibly that care could have been taken care of either at a primary care facility or um, through maybe an urgent care facility. Um, but these are all things that drive, you know, our goals within Nebraska. Next slide. And just as an overview, um, of course, the, for Nebraska Total Care, we will cover at a minimum those benefits and services that um, are part of the agreement with DHHS for the Heritage Health Program. Um, there, of course, will be additional services that um, each of the MCOs will offer. Uh, but at a bare minimum, it, it will cover the core benefits and services outlined in our agreement. All out-of-network, where you may hear us refer to non-participating services, will require prior authorization. Um, we are working on our prior auth list, but I will tell you that it will be a minimal list um, for those who are contracted providers. Um, this prior auth list, of course, excludes anything family planning related, uh, emergency room or tabletop x-ray related. And later on in the presentation, we'll talk about the pre-auth um, tool that we offer on our secure provider portal. Next slide. So if we talk about the contracting and credentialing process for Nebraska Total Care, um, we also used the state um, listing that was provided to us of any Nebraska provider that had a Nebraska Medicaid ID number currently. So that is the, um, the listing we used. The goal was to only mail out one packet per tax ID per location. Um, that, that's the goal, and you know, so to not bombard you completely. But in that packet, we included a welcome letter, a participating provider agreement, um, some marketing pieces, a provider data form, and also a disclosure of ownership form. And to let you know, on the disclosure of ownership form, we also will accept the one that you have submitted to DHHS for your Nebraska provider enrollment. Uh, we would simply accept a copy of that as long as that was current. Next slide. Uh, we've been asked many times if we are uh, seeking a narrow network in Nebraska. And of course, since we're very new to the market, uh, we are accepting any willing provider because the goal is to have a robust network and provide the best access for the Medicaid membership throughout the state. Just to also touch on components of the agreement, because um, this is something that you should look for um, and be certain that it fits um, what was in your packet. The standard language is going to be consistent because our provider agreement, uh, because we are Medicaid only in Nebraska, is going to be uh, standard boilerplate language to match any provider type. There also is the state mandated language that has to be in our contracts. And then, of course, the rate exhibit that's specific to your provider type. And that's something that I would encourage um, each provider to review um, You know, when you're looking at the contract. Make sure the rate exhibit includes any type of reimbursement that if, you know, if you're a solo practitioner, that might be different. But if you are um, a larger provider that, ha you know, you offer multiple services, just make sure that the appropriate rate exhibits are part of the contract that you received. And then again, we also offer delegated credentialing. And our DCA, that agreement is actually part of the contract. So it's not two separate agreements. Next slide. This slide is just to kind of give you an example, and I won't reiterate what the other MCOs and what uh, Carmen had indicated uh, regarding CAQH. But if you're not part of CAQH, this kind of gives you an idea of the different elements for a practitioner. Um, so at the uh, provider level, these are the forms that are necessary um, to upload into CAQH and to keep current. Next slide. And again, this would be the credentialing elements for an organization. So I won't um, belabor on this, but this just gives you a sample of those forms and what the, they look like um, that will be part of CAQH. Next slide. Okay, provider relations. Um, we at Nebraska Total Care, is, um, it's a little bit unique. Uh, it's not the typical provider relations uh, staffing model that you would um, maybe see um, currently, uh, it's more than just someone that you can reach out to to speak to about, you know, following up on a claim issue or concern or getting assistance to walk through our provider portal. 
uh, they will be available um, to you. And again, we will have um, basically a department that is regionalized, so the provider relations reps will be um, assigned to territory and also possibly um, at the you know, larger provider level um, so that they have one contact to go to. And they will also be available to review all the different tools that are available, uh, provide training to your staff, and also um, be able to assist you with reviewing the reports that are available because we know that data is extremely important. So the provider relations model that we have, uh, the people that are assigned in the field will be able to sit with you and review the provider data and information that's available to you down to the member level. And I want to just point out also that this 800 number for the member provider service line, it is, um, you know, that is definitely the number, but it is not functional yet. So because at this point, you know, we, we really, uh, are not set up for that, but that number on the bottom that you'll also see on the last slide is the number to reach us for any concerns at this point. So contracting credentialing is really the phase that we're in right now, but if there are other concerns, if you call that number, uh, they will route you to the appropriate person to answer your question. Next slide. And this just uh, kind of goes into um, more detail about that provider network specialist or provider engagement um, member that you will be assigned, uh, you know, for you for dedicated staff. So again, um, provider education. Um, and as we uh, present more or later on on the secure provider tool that we have available, you will be able to see that you know there will be care gaps that will be identified. So this is something that your provider relations representative can assist you with. Uh, financial analysis, again, that's tied to the different uh, various reporting um, capabilities that are available to you through the portal. Um, if you have a new provider that's going to be credentialed, uh, again, you can work through your provider relations for that, rep for that as well. Um, and again, I won't uh, go through each bullet, but you know, any issues with your provider roster or membership issues can also be routed through the provider relations representative. Next slide. Okay, and at this point, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Michelle Groshu, who is the Senior Director of Behavioral Health Contracting and Network Development, and she's going to speak to you uh, about the website and the secure provider tool and different things that are available to you as a contracted provider. Michelle? Thank you, Nancy. Um, our website includes a series of web-based tools and a secure portal to support the needs of our providers and stakeholders. So next slide. So part of these web-based tools includes um, provider information regarding medical services, copy of our provider manual and billing manual, uh, prior authorization code checker, operational forms such as prior authorization forms, notification of pregnancy forms, et cetera, the all-important clinical practice guidelines, any provider newsletters and announcements, updates on planned news, and the find a provider. Um, Nebraska Total Care is committed to enhancing our web-based tools and technologies, so we are open to any and all of your suggestions. So as Nancy pointed out, you can reach us at this phone number, which will not be functional yet, but there is an alternate number that you can call us, and we would be happy to take in those suggestions. Next slide. We also offer a secure provider portal for our network contracted providers. And inside this portal, uh, network providers are able to verify member eligibility and patient listing, health records and care gaps, review authorizations, submit claims, as well as check the status of a claim. You can also correct claims and do adjustments through this portal. You can review payment history, monthly PCP co um, cost reports, and registration um, for this portal is free and easy, and our network specialist can help get you started. Next slide. Provider reports are available on Nebraska Total Care's um, secure provider web portal. They're generated on a monthly basis and can be exported to a PDF or Excel format. These reports include, but are not limited to, patient lists of HEDA's care gaps, emergency room utilization, pharmacy reports, and high cost claims. Next slide. 
So at this time, I'm going to hand the presentation over to Jenny Clark, who's going to talk to you about our clinical model. Thank you. Um, thank you for joining us today, and I just want to speak briefly about our clinical model, model and our approach in our community and meeting with our members and the population with our boots on the ground um, member connection program. These member connection programs are face-to-face -face interactions, and these are team members who are from the local community, who understand and know our population well, and are able to build strong relationships um, with the community, within the community, as well as be a liaison to our care management team and program specialists who help guide and support the members who are of a higher risk that would require special needs, behavioral indicators, or other case management or care management opportunities. The member connection representatives that are within our communities throughout the entire state have multiple programs where they engage with the community centers as well as churches and other local leaders to support and give access to the community for community events, educational opportunities, and allowing just the opportunity for us to promote healthy living, preventative care, education regarding diseases, as well as strong support for our pregnant membership who are out there within the communities and ensuring that folks are able to overcome any barriers to care. Our care management team is, and member connection reps are trained intensely on cultural sensitivity. We are very aware of the various um, community sizes as well as the different cultures throughout the entire state, rural, as well as um, very remote and urban. We also concentrate on and focus on discharge planning from the moment any of our members are admitted into hospitals to ensure successful discharge upon returning back into their homes and the community, ensuring that they um, receive any post-care, pharmaceutical needs, care management when appropriate to help them require a successful engagement back into the community. Next slide. In the earlier slides, our team has spoken much about parts of our medical management team. Utilization management is important to us, um, and we try to streamline these efforts and requests of our providers to ensure that you are able to obtain the information you need, prior authorizations, and we guide it as seamless as possible. We can't encourage you enough to utilize our secure portal and the website as it does provide a very quick resource um, off services, if you will, to check either by code and or in a um, word format to help you identify first off if a, re if a prior authorization is required. And if so, you can create your prior auth request online at that moment in time or please reach out to us by phone um, you can also fax requests to us, and we will return your prior auth request to you as required by our contract and mentioned earlier in these presentations. Our clinical proactive uh, practice guidelines, excuse me, are also located on this site, which are um, of a great resource, and we encourage you to utilize this tool as much as you can in helping you guide through streamlining and better operations to meet and get the services to our members in a timely fashion and not provide any barriers to um, your day-to-day -day operation. Concurrent review, the hospitals where we have high utilization for inpatient admission um, and much engagement, we will have boots on the ground again with concurrent review nurses who will be within the buildings as we uh, are able to do so in team and sync with our member connection reps and care management for discharge planning. Next slide. Just to reiterate again, our prior off processes, you can tele use telephonic, the provider portal, or fax. 
as well on these sites, you can also reach our member connections for referrals as well as care management. Next slide. We just want to again um, appreciate your attendance today and participation in learning more about Nebraska Total Care, and we look forward to working with you in the near future. Thank you. Nancy? Thank you, and I will turn it back to Carmen at DHHS. Okay, thank you to all of the plans for sharing your information. Now we'll turn it over to Heather Lashinsky and she will tackle some of your questions that you've submitted in our Q&A log. Good morning. We have had several questions related to these PowerPoints, uh, questions related to will these PowerPoints be available on our website. And our previous um, presentations and PowerPoints for our previous webinars are already posted to our website. Um, and again, that address is dhhs.ne. Dot gov forward slash heritage health, all one word. And on that page, you will see three boxes at the bottom. One of them says resources. When you click on that, you will be able to go to the materials that we have from our previous slides, the slides from today's presentation, and also the recording from today's presentation will also be posted to that website once we have the recording available to post. Um, in addition to that, you can also subscribe to that page. Um, at the very top of that page, you can subscribe and enter your email address and you will receive emails every time we update that page, which includes an email notifying you when we have uploaded today's recording and today's presentation to our, um, to our website. Um, the next set of questions um, have to do with long-term services and supports clients. So there are several questions related to that. So I will hopefully globally answer all of those questions in this answer. So the, sir, the clients who are currently carved out of our physical health managed care are long-term care clients who may be re residing in a nursing facility or receiving their services through home and community-based waivers. Those clients will be carved into our Heritage Health program, and our Heritage Health plans will be covering their physical health, their behavioral health, and their pharmacy services. Their long-term services and supports, i.e. their custodial room and board for nursing facility, um, or their waiver payment for assisted living, those will remain as they are billed today, fee for service, to the state. Um, the clients will be enrolling, though, in a health plan, and our enrollment broker will be responsible for providing them the choice counseling and um, enrollment activities that are delegated to them for the Heritage Health Program. Um, included in our long-term services and supports are services coordination through either our Area Agency on Aging or our League of Human Dignity. Um, we do have state staff that provide services coordination and then also our early development network provided services coordination. Those services, again, are, are, are considered LTSS and will be um, provided and billed for as they are today. We do have requirements in the Heritage Health contracts that our Heritage Health plans, case managers specifically, um, do coordinate with the services coordinators for clients on our waiver programs to ensure that there's a full spectrum and a full coordination of care. We do have a question that is specific to well care, so I'm going to let well care answer this question. The question is, we contacted well care about contracting and we're told DME providers are required to go through Integra. Integra contract requires we submit claims to them and they charge a fee per claim. Can we contract direct with WellCare? So I'm going to let WellCare address that question. Thank you, Heather. Uh, we do use Integra as our DME uh, network for services. However, I would like to ask that that provider email tracy.smith at wellcare.com with your specific information and let us reach out to you individually um, and, and talk through possible solutions.
Our next question is specifically for United Healthcare, so I will let United Healthcare answer this question. And the question is, does United Healthcare have time limits for billing claims? Uh, if you're talking about uh, timely filing, um, we do have uh, timely filing guidelines there specific to each provider's um, contract. So if you're contract with that, you just want to check your contract. If you have specific questions, you can send me an email. My contact information is listed in the uh, presentation. Um, our next question is request is directed to all plans, but I'm not sure that it's just all plans. So the question is, will all plans require mail order prescription through Optum Rx? I guess I'll let each of the health plans um, address this one specifically. I do want to let you know as far as requirements in their contract, um, we have provisions in their contract that the health plans cannot require a client to receive their um, their prescriptions specific or specifically through the mail order benefits. So there are some protections for our clients around that within our contract and I guess I'll let the health plans address um, mail order through OptumRx. Yeah, this is Jeremy with United Healthcare. I can start uh, since OptumRx is a United Health Group company. Um, we are contracting with all pharmacies across the state, independent, um, and um, OptumRx is our pharmacy arm that, that does that for us. Uh, we are not requiring uh, members to have to go through a mail order, um, although we will have that available if a member uh, would like to go that, that route and if that's more convenient for them. Uh, but we will be contracting um, you know, statewide with all of the pharmacies, uh, both chain and independent and uh, mail order that are enrolled with the state Medicaid program. Hi, this is Laura Lee from WellCare. We do not require uh, mail order pharmacy and like, like Jeremy said for United, WellCare will be contracting with all pharmacies. Hi, this is Nancy Davis with Nebraska Total Care, and uh, we do not require that ever end, but we actually do not use Optum. Uh, we have our own PBM through Involve, which was part of our presentation, uh, so it will be through our own um, Involve pharmacy. I do want to go back and clarify one more question that came regarding long-term services and supports. I do want to remind everybody um, or let those who are new to this program know that one of the benefits within the Heritage Health um, covered services is short-term rehabilitative nursing services. So there, if there is a client who does need to go to a nursing facility for a short-term rehabilitation stay, that is covered by the Heritage Health Plan and those nursing facilities will need to be contracted with the health plan for, um, for that service. If the client is admitted to a facility on uh, what we what we at the state call custodial level of care, or if their stay begins with a skilled rehab stay and um, transitions to a custodial level of care, that nursing facility room and board service will be billed to the state as it is today, but that client will continue to remain in, enrolled in a heritage health plan. So I did want to add one more caveat to our long-term services and supports answer. Um, the next question, I believe I'll answer it, and if um, United Healthcare wants to add anything more to it, well, I'll go ahead and let United Healthcare just answer the question. If we are already credentialed with United Healthcare Community Plan in Iowa, do we need to do any credentialing with Nebraska? So I will let United Healthcare answer that question. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, thanks, Heather. Um, for credentialing, if you're credentialed already with United Healthcare through the Iowa, um, you are credentialed with um, United Healthcare Community Plan. Um, however, you may need to um, go through the contracting process for Nebraska to make sure 
that we've included the Nebraska uh, regulatory appendix and appropriate fee schedules. Uh, so if you have some further questions about that, you can uh, contact me directly and I will make sure that we get someone to contact you about that. Thank you, Jeremy. We also have quite a few questions about the CAQH process. Um, we do want to let providers know that the CAQH process is our attempt to administratively simplify the credentialing process for our providers. So if you are already in CAQH or you've most recently created a profile, you can, con you can let the health plans know what your CAQH number is. You do need to let them know or you do need to make it reflective in CAQH that you're going to let these health plans retrieve your credentialing information. But that is not the only way that providers will be credentialed through Heritage Health. So each of the health plans does have their own credentialing and contracting process that if you are not in CAQH or you're a provider that maybe cannot get um, enter information into CAQH because it's not a licensed provider or anything like that. We do want to let you know that it's not the only option. It is just one of the options to help administratively simplify the credentialing process. Um, so we, I wanted to make sure that was clear too. The next question again is for United Healthcare. Um, have received conflicting information about whether or not United Healthcare will be offered statewide in Nebraska. Oh, I can answer this one. Will United Healthcare be offered to recipients in Western Nebraska? Um, that was part of the presentation and the fact that we are, the new Heritage Health Plans will be operating statewide. We will no longer have service areas with plans specific to each of those service areas. So United Healthcare, Nebraska Total Care, and WellCare will all be operating. They will have providers across the state and they will all be having members across the state enrolled in their health plan. Um, the next question has to do with receiving a list of services that need prior authorize. Um, each of the health plans will be addressing that in, the, in future um, summits or webinars related to their specific um, processes for their network providers. So providers who become credentialed and contracted with the health plans will have access to each of those health plans information regarding prior authorization, um, utilization management, and that sort of thing. Um, the next question is for all, and I'll, so I will let each one of them answer it. Um, will you also contract with in-office dispensing entities? This is United Healthcare. We can answer that. Yes, um, we will. So we will be, um, if there's like an FQHC that has an in-house pharmacy uh, that dispenses, we will uh, contract with those pharmacies. Um, if there is a long-term uh, care provider that um, um, has residents and has a pharmacy, um, we will contract with that dispensing pharmacy as well. Hi, this is Nancy Davis with Nebraska Total Care. And just as well, we will also uh, contract with any willing pharmacy. Hi, and this is Laura Lee with WellCare. Uh, same answer, yes, we will. The next question is directed to Nebraska Total Care. Is there another website that is up and running? Information, question mark, information at this time is very limited. So I will let Nebraska Total Care address that. Thank you, it's Nancy Davis again. And the Nebraska Total Care website is still, um, it is up and running, but I realize there is limited information. I would suggest uh, calling the 800 number if you want someone, um, maybe possibly a face-to-face -face visit to provide you with more detail or, you know, at minimum a phone call. So I would suggest just reaching out to that 800 number. You can also provide my name uh, for that outreach as well, Nancy Davis.
Okay, thank you. Um, I do want to add two more updates to the LTSS population based on additional questions that have come in. Um, we, do want to rem we do want to let people know that clients who are enrolled in the PACE program are not mandatory to enroll into Heritage Health. Therefore, if they are in um, on an AD waiver or are receiving LTSS services and transition to PACE, they actually will be waived out of the Heritage Health program to be enrolled into the PACE program. And then another question has um, been asked if, uh, regarding people who have Medicare primary and Medicaid secondary. Um, regardless of where those individuals are living or the services that they are receiving, um, the client who has Medicare primary and Medicaid secondary will be enrolled into Heritage Health, again, for their physical health, behavioral health, and pharmacy services. Um, the next question, what differences should we be looking for when signing contracts, question mark, payment info? Should SNF, um, skilled nursing facility and AL contract with all companies? Um, hopefully I've addressed the last part of that in the fact that skilled nursing facilities will need to contract with the companies as it relates to the skilled rehab service. Um, and, you know, each of the health plans will have stream have similar credentialing and then the contracting will be the negotiated part between the health plan and the provider um, and each of the health plans will have different negotiations around payment and that sort of thing. So if there's more information we can give to better answer that question, if you can go ahead and submit a follow-up question, um, please do. The next one is specifically to WellCare. Will WellCare be credentialing and reimbursing provisional and licensed mental health practitioners? Lorley? Thank you. The, the specifics around that particular, if they're provisional, they still have to be operating under a supervising provider. Um, I can certainly provide you more detail. Again, I believe this question has come up in a couple of different uh, environments. And the key is whether or not they're rendering services under a licensed supervising provider. If you'd like more specifics, again, I'll ask you to send that directly to Tracy and we will respond to you directly. Okay, our next question is asking, do all current Nebraska Medicaid providers be enrolled with all three MCOs? Um, same for the group practice. So the managed care program, of course, we at the state are, we have network adequacy standards that all of the managed care plans must meet with their provider networks. Um, and so we are encouraging robust networks, but Medicaid providers ultimately decide which, if any, of the managed care, the heritage health plans, they will be um, providing or being participating in the network for. With that being said, Nebraska Medicaid providers who choose not to enroll in one or any of the health plans must be aware that if they provide services to a member who's enrolled in that health plan, they do not the, the managed care plan is not obligated to pay them for their services if the provider is out of network. There are a couple of caveats to that in, in that emergency service, emergency room services, family planning services, and Indian health services um, are an exception to that rule, but overall, if the provider is not enrolled in the Heritage Health Plan network for that certain particular plan and that client is enrolled in that plan, the Heritage Health Plan does not have to pay that provider. 
Okay, it looks like we're at the end of our questions that have been submitted so far. I do want to let everyone know, in addition to these materials being posted to the Heritage Health website, there is also an opportunity to post questions onto our Heritage Health site. So again, if you go to that webpage, dhhs.ne.gov forward slash heritage health, all one word. There is a box that says questions, and when you click on that box, you will have the opportunity to click on a button that says if you have a question so to submit, click here, I think is what it says. And then when you click on that, then you can enter the question, and that does come to us at the state to address, to either send specifically to a Heritage Health Plan to address, or we will address it um, at the state level. In addition to that, we also do have that um, provider FAQ that is posted to the website for our providers, and then we also have a member FAQ. So thank you everyone for attending today. Um, we will please watch our website and subscribe to our page. We plan to have um, a similar, similar um, webinars, and then we also plan to have webinars provider webinars specifically focused for behavioral health providers and for our pharmacy providers. So thank you everyone and have a great day.